All right, so I'm here with Larry Hunter, recently appeared on the Beyond Belief show with George Nori, and we're doing a Q&A follow-up because there was a lot of questions that came from people in the comments and whatnot, and just the format of the show, you know, 30 minutes, it's really hard to fit in all the information, all the evidence, pictures, graphics, media, so uh, Larry wanted to do a follow-up Q&A, uh, so Larry and I are sharing a cup of coffee here over Skype. Larry, how you doing? Doing fine. Good, good morning there, Jesse. Good, good. So let's just hop right into it. Um, you put together some of the questions, um, some of the information you wanted to cover, um, you know, just couldn't get to in time. So why don't we jump to that? Well, for clarity purposes, you know, that you're right. The show did move very fast and, and what we're trying to do here is add some more photos to help reinforce what we had talked about on the the Beyond Belief show and I don't know if uh, the audience kind of they're curious as to how and why uh, I first became interested in Egypt well this started back in when I was in the Navy of course everybody kind of got that idea already but on the left uh, this first photograph is me and when I'm about 29 years old and I've sort of experienced a pyramid falling on me and when that pyramid fell on me I went into intense research and study uh, of it and so it ended up uh, uh, yielding me a United States patent for 509-501 of which you can get an idea on the right picture there of the light reflecting off of a mirrored pyramid with the same geometry as the Great Pyramid and that light represents the summer solstice of light reflecting off the Giza Plateau in Egypt. So with that interest I was looking for an alternative to energy systems and was studying the Great Pyramid's geometry as a device that would counteract the effects of refractions and heat radiations. Basically what it does is it creates a constant set of reflections off the pyramid that will reoccur year after year uh, throughout the, 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 the life of this thing. And this picture that we're looking at now is just the reflective patterns and how they would interact with the structures around the Great Pyramid. The uh, top being north and the bottom being south and you know, the east and west. And then they seem to have a, a Fibonacci ratio of curves that you can see from the Great Pyramid here uh, moving back to the second and on around the third and, and then those would uh, end up in an area uh, down south of the pyramids there. But anyway, my interest was in energy uh, and sunlight and this seemed to be the best example of, of anything on the planet that would control uh, the light of the sun flawlessly. Okay, what was your first trip to Egypt like and what did you discover during that trip that's drawn you there? Uh, you've been there over 40 times? Yes. Well, the first trip was back in 1979 um, and I had just finished a semester of college and had all these ideas about pyramids and solar energy in my head and the best next thing was to go to Egypt, so I did and it was like a, a twilight zone kind of an experience. <laughs> first time there, backpack, going into the airport, luggage doesn't come in or my backpack and when it does it's strewn out all over the the carrier belts there for picking your uh, suitcases up but then on the way from there into Cairo uh, never having been there being all alone uh, I was sort of at the mercy of like the homing pigeon I just had this strong desire to be there and I was going to be there and I was and this was for the summer solstice of 1979 and then during that trip uh, standing there watching the sunrise come up exactly on time looking out over the little pyramids on the east side of the Great Pyramid the sunrise was right exactly calculated by me with a navigator and very good chronometers and clocks with me I was impressed so with that I continued my journey of taking the regular tourist tours around and ended up going in um, to the Great Pyramid and when I was in there uh, on down at the bottom um, some strange events occurred with me that really were life altering and it basically broke down to if you could hear let you hear more or less and what I was hearing was echoes of a room that I had never read about in any book so that uh, soundtrack of this uh, secret room down the bottom of the pyramid really uh, was something that drew me back 
uh, stronger than anything. Okay, so real quick And then quick down here, here in the bottom of the Great Pyramid is where I was laying uh, when I got scanned by a tremendous energy field that was very physical. And from this area here all the way up to this room here in the King's Chamber, I could hear voices echoing in what I soon to discover was a room that's over 250 feet from this location up to where I could hear the guides making this coffer sound with tours that were coming up and in and making a lot of noise and then they would leave and I would hear this repeated over and over and over again while I lay here on the ground. So where you, you were where your mouse is right now, is that what you're saying? Right here is where I crawled back 52 feet and I lay right there, there's a little bubble at the end of it about a oh well it's about six feet I believe that this this area protrudes bulges to the west and then it has a little arch to it so it's something that you can sit up because this passage is only 29 inches <coughs> wide <clears throat> and 31 inches high but it's about 52 feet 9 inches long mm -hmm. so, so point, I, point your mouse where you think um, you said there was a, another another room in there somewhere well, above my head is where I'm hearing all these echoes uh -huh. through here. And my own voice would echo for seconds after I had made any kind of sound. But then I would hear the loud rumbling of like large crowds going in my and the echoes. And then I would hear boom, boom. And this would be the guy that would take tours inside the pyramid. He was giving the bell sound of that box or the coffer inside the room and I could hear it down here. So I knew that what this echoes I was hearing from my own voice, when I heard the echoes coming from this room, I knew that this was a large, large room and was not just solid rock that would appear in the, the, the uh, drawings and nowhere written in any book was this phenomenon described. So that was a big discovery for me in 1979. My first trip to Egypt, within the first couple of days, this uh, fell on me. So that what do, you, really, what do you mean fell on you? Well, I wasn't expecting it. It was, you know, like a lot of when you go to research something and then all of a sudden some unusual phenomenon occurs that's uh, life altering. Well, that's what happened to me right here on the ground uh, in no uncertain terms. It, okay, so metaphorically, okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, it's, but I felt it, and what happened, you know, it's, it's taken years for me to absorb uh, the magnitude of, of, of this encounter uh, back in June of 1979, and okay. I can't get enough of it, so I go back year after year. <laughs> All right, and we'll, and we'll get to that, and I, I do want to bring up again, um, summer solstice is, is when you were there, you mentioned outside. Um, I know summer solstice will come back up again, very important um, regarding the solar energy. Right. Um, and then, again, I want to I want to reiterate um, for those that maybe didn't see the show, Mr. Hunter was in the Navy, navigator in the Navy, um, which, you know, definitely brings a very valuable skill to all this. Um, so, let's, yeah, let's just move on to the next question. Um and you kind of already hit up on it, unopened chamber you discovered in 1979? Right. This is the uh, picture of that dead-end passage that we were just looking at uh, from the end of it, looking back in toward the subterranean chamber. Okay. Now, it's this little tube that I crawled out to that I lay down on the ground, and I was sitting there and listening to the echoes of my voice and just playing around. Uh, because instead of being claustrophobic, uh, this was very open. I mean, you could say, Larry, 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 and it would, it would go for uh, a good while. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what I was doing is, is that uh, this photograph here is a retake from the 1979 trip, but I took a video camera down and recorded the sounds of the, uh, one of the inspectors up in the King's Chamber he was making noise so I could record the sound down here in the bottom to confirm that that chamber was there. I have that video to this day. Mm -hmm. But this is the, the dead end passage and this is the very end of it. And it's directly above your head uh, in this location that this uh, would be the floor of the room above you or you know if you can relate to what I'm doing, saying here. I'm underneath this room and this is the, the uh, stonework that's there. 
So, so no, no diggings happened to find. Well, I think that people after I left, because I have a photographic history. Every time I go back, I try to uh, do this wall. Other people, I'm sure, are aware of this sound because it's like they're trying to bust through this wall to get to the echoes that are on the other side, but the echoes are actually straight up above your head. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're continuing to uh, chip away at this wall, but it's just solid. And the way to go would be right up through the floor. And, uh, but there are other ways in there. This is, this is if you're trying to figure out how to get into that room. Your imagination has, you know, takes a play here. Now, did you tell anybody anybody about that? You know, what you thought yeah. was a room up there. Yes, I did. The, as soon as this happened, I was a little nervous because I was afraid people heard me and what was being said down below. But luckily, when I came out of the uh, descending passage back into the corridor, every light in the pyramid went off, and and the guys had stay there, but I didn't. I came out into the darkness of everything with everybody yelling, "Hey, what's going on?" And I immediately went out to the front of the pyramid entrance and told the uh, chief watchman that there was a secret room down in the bottom of the pyramid that uh, should be opened. And that was my first uh, revelations to anyone was the uh, chief watchman of the Great Pyramid. And uh, this man's dead today, but his sons and stuff still live there in the village. Mm. The Fayed family. So anyway, that's a little bit on the, the secret chamber. And then from there, uh, in that same trip, I happened to be up in the king's chamber. And, and in this photograph, when you say, what other secrets can you share? One, uh, you're looking at my uh, hand making a, a somewhat line on the, the coffer in the king's chamber. Okay. And then the next photograph, you'll see my left foot is on the floor of the, the, the chamber. Now, whenever I step my right foot on the floor of inside the coffer, you can see that I'm a good distance from the bottom uh, of that box in the floor. To me, from my foot in this lower left picture here to the floor is uh, a phenomena of the, uh, the uh, coffer that makes it sound like a bell when you hit it because I think that it's hollow all through here where from my foot down to the floor is a storage space in this coffer and there may be some very 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 valuable uh, artifacts that are still contained within that sarcophagi so that's another discovery that you know I'm putting it up now in case somebody comes along and tries to say they found it I've known this from many many years 1979 on up into uh, today so but there are a lot more uh, things that I've discovered over the the, the years, uh, but those are two of my uh, what I class biggies. This would be my next uh, couple of biggies would be um, having gone there and had my ear to the ground and listened to everyone. Uh, we would say the secrets of the locals in the village of the pyramid uh, are very revealing in the the things that they show you if you can gain their confidence right. and trust. And on the left, back in 1998, I believe I did this one, there's a hole there that seems to be going down. Well, that hole I have the video of, you can see a lot of the rubble. Uh, there were people that redug this hole, and this hole was originally dug in 1925, uh, but now is coming under scrutiny of uh, people that had the uh, books of the doctors from that time and they're following uh, back and going and re uh, uh, digging some of the areas that one there leads to the underground city uh, of that's that's all underneath the Giza plateau now can you pull this up on a on an overhead map just so we get a visual of where this is at uh, it'll come up a little bit later. I have the uh, the photograph of, of where this would be, but I have to kind of flip forward first and then bring it back. You want to wait till you get to the picture or you want me to do it? This is the overhead picture that would take you where I've got my video camera filming a hole. Uh -huh. This hole was dug in 1925. You can see that it's larger than the Sphinx, which I'm circling now. And whenever they covered all this back up, you can see the lines coming out here. This is a 1925 dig uh, aerial photograph uh, that kind of lets us see what the plateau was like, and it gives us a history 
of things that took place that we don't see the books today. And it's from this location that I'm sitting there uh, filming that uh, an author went down and went river rafting underneath this whole Giza plateau and his comments are uh, awesome. He released this video in Australia and we've never seen it here in the West. But uh, really, he told me personally that you could fit the Sistine Chapel in Rome underneath this plateau, and the top of that uh, Sistine Chapel would not touch the ceiling of, of the, the, uh, the uh, city that's underneath here. Now, who, who is this? It's J.J. Hertak, Dr. J.J. Hertak. Okay. And uh, so when you're looking at this one, and I'll come back to this photograph again, because there's a lot of other uh, interesting elements that are present here from 1925 that, um, that really it's for the first time as an example where we see this indentation panel. This was really not a known phenomenon of the pyramid that became uh, more or less uh, public when these kinds of photographs actually showed the eight different sides, well that's more in facets wise, of this great pyramid. And this is a major, major discovery, as well as the digging that was going here. Because actually, in this time, they went underneath and accessed the Great Pyramid from this hole, uh, as well as the Sphinx. So this is 1925 uh, uh, doctor's work that the people in this village dug these holes. And that's why I do mind archaeology uh, with the Egyptians when I'm there. So let's go back to the other one where we were. Now you had you. I mean, you told me a lot of stories just in the short time that uh, we sat down at Denny's once. Pretty pretty interesting stories of the villagers there. Just want to throw that out there. You can pick up where you left off, though. Well, we were over here, and, and basically, I like what you're doing. There it gives the the listener uh, a little bit more perspective on this area because it is so large that. You could say secret room and there's so many rooms, you know, you don't know until you say exactly where. But graphically speaking, this one is down near the cemetery at the foot of the third uh, pyramid, the end of the causeway, where you find most of this activity. Now over here, uh, when I'm doing this film, uh, that's uh, this photograph on my left, this is the man that, that took the photograph that you would say, well, uh, where did that picture? This man is Amin Abdurrahman Shire. He is the chief watchman of the Sphinx after the sabotage where the large stone fell uh, uh, back in the 90s. Amin Shire is uh, my teacher, my guide. He's the one that informed me that Dr. Hawass was uh, selling uh, or letting people for a million dollars uh, buy or look at the books that the doctors from the 1920s had uh, uh, been their research. Mm -hmm. And then he's taking me to these positions and showing me uh, where the people today that spent that money uh, went and did their digs. This is one of them. Now, over on the uh, right-hand side, this is a gentleman that uh, I've known for many years in Egypt. And we're talking about some of his secrets that he's discovered uh, that goes on that nobody would hear about. He's showing me in the village, uh, actually it's near the uh, Sphinx on the south side, an entry point where they went down uh, underground, curving around, and then you end up in like water. And you walk for about, oh, 50, 60 feet. And on your left, I made a mistake. It's a 60-foot basalt boat, not uh, 25, like I said, on the Nori show uh, or the uh, Beyond Belief. But so this man here is a, an eyewitness to, to, to those events and I made all the notes and things in my book that uh, describe the winches that are in there, the uh, boat that was on top of this basalt boat and, and the, the platforms that were floating that they would stand on while they're working in this and there's a lot of details regarding this that are fascinating. And then from that boat, he would go on around and turn to the right, and it was a pit with three women uh, statues dancing, and then he continued a little bit more. And he said he saw a causeway over a thousand feet long shooting up in the angle of between the first and second pyramids uh, going up the plateau. And that this thing was over 240 feet across and at least 40 or 50 feet uh, in the ceilings. And he personally went down there, and, and now that hole is closed up, but he's showing me where the entrance points are. 
So with secrets like that coming from the village, I was always well entertained, if you will. Sure. <laughs> to new and new and new and new. Can you pause for a second?